But glad you guys are here where it's warm and uh, where we can hear from uh, Judy Richards, who is becoming a friend of mine. She was my professor. So I was in the MDiv program at Western Seminary, and I noticed that I needed some electives, and she was teaching human development. So this is where you do a flyby over all the stages of life, and you just get some basic understanding of the key issues facing each area of, of growth. So um, apparently, though, I was one of the only pastors that took that, the only one. So I didn't know that pastors didn't, didn't cross over to the counseling courses, which needs to change, and I, I gave Western that feedback. Um, but I just found in Judy um, someone who I had a lot of resonance with her and how she uh, taught and the way she was approached life. Um, and in that course, there were some topics on sex came up. And so when I was thinking about uh, wanting to address sexual abuse, I, uh, I called Judy. And we had a great conversation about the importance of addressing this topic. Um, and she was willing to come out. So she lives in Santa Cruz. Um, we were able to put her in a hotel, uh, the Doubletree in the Berkeley Marina. Uh, if you guys have better recommendations, let me know. But that's kind of the go-to for guests. Yeah, it's pretty good. Um, and uh, so, but she's come a long way to help us, and I'm really thankful for her. She's going to be sharing not only from her professional experience, but from her personal experience. Um, so we're uh, I'm very, I feel very honored to have her to share that. Um, I know this is a, a topic that touches all of our lives, uh, and so many of you, I hope, um, will be benefit from this personally, or someone you know, uh, whether it's for yourself or just equipping you and knowing how to minister to somebody who's gone through something like this. Uh, is helpful. And of course, this is part of all of our story as, as human beings, the brokenness of life, the brokenness of sex. This is why we're, we're doing this series. Um, and so, yeah, I'm glad to, I'm excited to hear from Judy. Her, her talk is called Untying the Knots and Connecting the Dots. So there you go. It gives you some idea where we're going. Let me pray and then I'll have you come up. Lord, we ask that you would come and uh, bless this time together with your power your presence, your truth and wisdom flowing through Judy and uh, her experience, Lord, her training, uh, her biblical knowledge, and, and now the way you've uh, helped her um, bring this into uh, the place of a, of a presentation for us. And so I pray that you would, you'd be with her and you would uh, touch our lives with your truth and your grace. Um, and so, yeah, may this be a, a powerful time for us both in what she shares and in the time of dialogue afterwards. Uh, Lord, so we thank you for your grace. Thank you for leading us as a church to engage this topic and um, that we may continue to, to heal, to grow, and to follow you in all areas of our life, glorifying you with our bodies. So, Lord, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I did, uh, after she shares, she will open it up. We were hesitant to call it a Q&A. You didn't love that idea. More of a dialogue between us. Uh, that's Judy's teaching style, so I like that. So be thinking about that. Um, I just, I also would ask you to be sensitive about if you want to answer someone else's question. I'm not telling you not to, but just be thoughtful about that. If you have, if you do feel like you have something you can contribute, maybe maybe share that with Judy and, and, and we can keep a, a dialogue going about that. Um, so, okay. Judy, you ready? Yes, I am. It is a pleasure uh, to be here. It's a pleasure to have yet another opportunity to practice showing up as my awkward self. Anybody that's listened to Brenny Brown, she said the challenge is just to show up. Um, when Paul first reached out to me, um, I said, oh no, Paul, you don't want me, you want Bev Weens. She's the one that did those videos. She teaches human sexuality uh, for, for us, for our campus. And our campus is in um, Milpitas now. Uh, we have about 50 counseling students. Uh, we are a seminary training program. So students could become a counselor either a licensed marriage family therapist or a licensed professional clinical counselor through our program. It prepares people for both um, in the state of California. Um, students who come to us want to integrate their faith 
with counseling. Uh, there's a recognition that we are designed uh, by God, our brains, our bodies. It, it, it's a miraculous design. And I don't know how much I'm going to talk about the brain tonight, but just to say that one of the uh, little YouTube videos I show them is someone who's doing brain research. And he says he starts out by asking his students, how much, if, if what we knew was a mile, if the brain was a mile, how much would we know? Oh, half a mile, quarter of a mile. Three inches. Three inches. And there's so much we don't know about mental health. It's, it, it, it's almost like we don't want to know. <laughs> and again, this topic, and, and I'm just going to use the word trauma up front, because this, uh, it, it's a topic that nobody wants to talk about. And I'm going to put up the word um, because we carry shame. Um, I grew up in a shame-based family system. Um, a shame-based family system, we learn three unspoken rules. We don't talk. We don't trust, and we don't feel. So the thing about growing up in one of those families is you don't know that. You don't know you're in a shame-based family. You don't know that until, for me, coming into the um, master's program uh, when I was 32, um, back in 1985, way back. Um, and you start hearing information, and you start, for me, putting puzzle pieces together and making connections and realizing how knotted and how um, complex uh, the, these topics have become personally in my life. So when Paul reached out and said, you know, hey, we're doing this uh, series, and I said, I referred him to Bev, you know, Bev, she, she's, she's your person. <laughs> and then I would be sitting at my desk one day, and the phone rang, and normally I don't answer it because there's so much spam, right? It's like, if I don't recognize the number, I don't know, I'm going to... Um, Say it was Holy Spirit orchestrated. I told Paul that when I answered. <laughs> He's like, hey, Judy, it's Paul. And I'm like, oh, okay. And so he mentioned, he told me a little bit more about what, what he was doing, what your community is addressing, and how you're creating an opportunity for dialogue, uh, for healing, for learning about um, these hard topics, trauma, which to me goes right along with shame. Um, I, I can't say I didn't want to come, but this whole time I've sort of, I don't know if anybody's arm wrestled with the Holy Spirit. I didn't have a lot of time because when Paul called and I answered the phone, he's like, he was so excited. Hey! And I'm like, hey! <laughs> and I just resonated with his excitement. And then it's like, what have I done? Are you kidding me? I get to go talk? I have to talk? about something that in my family we never talked about. And not to brag about my age, but I'll be 70 in June. <laughs> so I have had a long journey uh, with the Lord on earth, um, without the Lord, turning my back on the Lord. Um, and some of my story, I'm hoping, will be, as Paul said, an opportunity to invite and encourage those of us that may not have the, it takes a lot of courage to face shame. Shame is hidden. That's what makes it shame. We want to hide. We don't want to be open. And not because we don't want to be open, we're protecting. We're protecting our heart. People have broken boundaries. People have taken advantage of us. People have physically and mentally and emotionally not respected and honored our bodies, our souls, and our spirits. And there's no way that, that those experiences cannot touch us 
and sometimes we have nots, and sometimes we've got these pieces that say, how does this, how does this connect? Um, I came into the field, like I said, back in 85 to 85 to 87, I got my master's degree in counseling at University of San Francisco. We met in Santa Cruz. I had two little children at the time, and my husband was able to stay home with them, allowing me to go to school at night. Counseling is a field where it's not content-oriented. It's very much internal, like you look at your family of origin, you talk about how you feel. And if you can imagine um, <laughs> me uh, being birthed from my family, and, and at 1920, I went up to Penn State, Penn State University, I'm a Pennsylvania, raised just south of Philadelphia. Um, huge campus. I don't know how big it is, but I felt lost. I mean, I was just overwhelmed. Um, I had no relational skills. If you don't know how to talk, how to represent yourself, how to speak up, if you don't recognize that you even have feelings, and if you don't trust people, and again, our, our family was very closed. I can't remember ever having a friend over. Our family was very much closed, like it's us. And I think that's because there was a lot of hiddenness. Um, it was very difficult to relate to people and to make connections with people. How do you do that if you don't have skills and tools for a relationship? And so what I did, which is what most of us humans do, is I said, there's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with me. Um, I didn't say that out loud, but looking back, uh, I didn't feel like I fit in. I didn't feel like I belonged. Um, when I came into my master's program, there was this opportunity to explore and discover and revisit um, places in my life and relational qualities in my life that I, I had not done before. Uh, there was a book specifically by an author named Claudia Black. She's in the addiction counseling field. Uh, it was called It Will Never Happen to Me. And Claudia Black was raised in an alco alcoholic family system. Both her parents were alcoholics. They lived over a bar. Uh, I still remember one of the stories she told was one of the guys from the bar stumbled up the stairs. Their apartment was over <laughs> the bar. And he doesn't even knock. He just opens the door and says, where's the restroom? And she had a sister and the sister's boyfriend over. And the girls both said, they just pointed down the hall. The guy stumbles down the hall, leaves, goes back down to the bar, and the boyfriend goes, who was that? And they said, who was what? Like, they didn't, that was normal life for them. They didn't even notice. That was how intrusive, right, boundaries were. There was no, no boundaries. Like, my bathroom is your bathroom. Might I say that unhealthy boundaries in an individual's life, a family's life, a community's life, creates the opportunity for victimization. And victimization, for me, how I define it, <laughs> is no voice, no choice, no power. And being a victim is, how can I explain this? Being, depending on at what age we're victimized. Again, Paul mentioned the human development, and there's, you know, if you think of a baby at eight months, if you think of a two-year-old, if you think of a five-year-old, a nine-year-old teenager, we go through different developmental stages. Our brains and our bodies are growing in response, again, to how God designed us. Um, depending on when you are a victim, and some of us have been victimized as a baby, what we know about babies is we don't have language. We don't know what's happening. Even as a four-year-old, um, 
my victimization happened as a four-year-old. And let me just go a little bit ahead and then, and then return to that. I, in my, in my uh, training as a, um, uh, in my master's degree, we had to do child abuse, ch child sexual abuse training. And there used to be an organization in San Jose, I don't know how long anybody's been here, it was called the Gioretta Institute. And what they did was they worked with perpetrators and victims and they tried to create empathy in their groups. Uh, it's no longer here, and I was back in Missouri for about 13, 12 years, so I don't know what happened. <laughs> it might not have worked. You know, uh, people that have been victimized by people that have been perpetrators, it, it's a hard, you can imagine. You got a lot of anger, you got a lot of frustration, you got people that don't get it. They don't get it. And so I'm assuming that for whatever reason that didn't work out. But one of the groups that I attended was called, uh, and I looked up this term to see if anybody's using it. It was a group, a recovery group, and it was AMAC. And it stands for Adults Molested as Children. And I was 32, 33 maybe at the time, can't remember exactly. But in that group, uh, people were talking about their experience of victimization. Up until that point, I had not remembered an experience that I had at age four. And when I heard people talking, again, in my mind, I'm thinking God gives us protection, and at such a point, at some time, maybe we're open, more open, and we hear things that we couldn't hear earlier. For whatever, for whatever reason, hearing these uh, folks tell their stories, I remembered that at four years old, and the reason I know it was four, uh, let me just say this, I don't know it was four. We lived in a mobile home park till I was five. We moved when I was five, and this was in the mobile home park. Little yard, white picket fence, trailer, mobile home, maybe a little bit behind where Paul's sitting. And we had a little Roy Rogers tent. I don't know if anybody remembers Roy Rogers, but <laughs> I had an older brother at that point and uh, a younger brother. I have a brother who's just a year younger than I. Um, I was out in the yard playing. There was a fence. My mom was less than 12 feet away. I have no idea who this person was, but I know it was a male and I know he was big. He came through the fence. I don't know if he grabbed me, but somehow we ended up in the tent, and that quickly, there was a finger in my vagina, and he was um, touching my clitoris. That quickly. I didn't know those words. I didn't know what happened. My mom was around. Nobody was around. I was alone. And that's the challenge. Trauma is not what happened to you, but what happens inside you. Like when that happens and nobody's there to be with you and you're alone, it, you're feeling abandoned, you're feeling lonely, you're feeling empty, you're feeling like, what do I do? Now, I didn't feel that as a four-year-old. Nope. <laughs> you know, that happened, I didn't even remember it. Even through, I got married at 26, no memory. So it was sitting with people telling their stories about being a, a, a molested as children that allowed me to get in touch with that. I say that because some of us might have those experiences. And let me go on and say this. Part of what happens when that happens to a child, you don't have words. Our body, and again, Paul is aware of this, um, one of the videos is the sexual arousal cycle. And for those of us women, we get aroused when we have clitoral stimulation. It's pleasurable. So later in my life, I'm gonna say six, seven, eight, nine, I had this habit of masturbating. Weird, right? I didn't get it. I had no idea. Looking back, 
I'm like, geez, I felt, I, I felt a lot of shame about that. Um, just because it seemed like something that, I don't even know if anybody used the word masturbation. <laughs> I don't think I even knew that word. But I do know what I was doing at night to soothe myself. And then we're jumping ahead. I'm kind of all over the place, but I'm, I'm trying to go somewhere where we can end up. Um, then you go to college, right? And now there's my goal, to be very honest, was an MRS degree. Anybody else wanted an MRS degree at college? That's you look for a husband and you get married. <laughs> my mom was a stay-at-home mom, uh, five kids. That was my goal, uh, married <laughs> and children. <laughs> um, Luckily, <laughs> God's grace uh, did not allow me to um, find <laughs> Mr. Wright in that environment because any Mr. Wright in that environment would not have been a healthy environment. So at college, I found myself at age 21, after drinking half a pint of lime vodka, I waited till I was 21, I'm a compliant child. Uh, anybody know what a blackout is? A blackout, you don't you don't go unconscious. You just are no longer aware. You're able to move. You can go with people, but you don't remember anything. Next morning, I'm in bed with a strange man. That was it. I, let me go back. I was raised in Sunday school. I have a little row of pins. 13 years, I didn't miss a Sunday. Dad took us camping. If we were camping in those days, the state parks would have um, rangers. You know, I mean, they'd have uh, fire, fire pits. And we'd go over to the fire pit, and we would have a church service. It was just very available. And they would sign a little form saying that I'd been there, and I would take it to the Methodist Sunday School. And Now, what I want to tell you is that the kids were sent to Sunday School. My parents didn't go to church. Hmm. Seems odd. Well, they have five kids. Maybe they just wanted to break. Hmm. At 16, I decided to join the church. Um, and so I went home and I asked my dad, hey, would you come to church? I'm going to join. He said, oh, no. If I walk into a church, it'll fall down. Scratching my head. The knot gets bigger. <laughs> I don't understand any of this stuff. Um, joined the church. Like I said, college. So I had a relationship with the Lord. I had actually given my life to the Lord as a teenager. And I don't know if anybody's had this experience, but I did that about five or six times. <laughs> because it got really uncomfortable. There was less of us in the seats than there was up here. And I'm like, ah, oh, I don't, I don't want to be noticed, so I'm going to go up here. But I did. I, I, my Sunday school teachers were amazing. They loved me. They gave me scripture verses with stickers on them. To this day, I love stickers. Um, I felt their love and their nurture. Vi Vacation Bible School. There was a sense of connection for me with the people of God and with God. Um, and then, as I'm going through these behaviors that were shameful and I felt guilty about and I felt used... Um, the other thing I want to add in here is objectification. As a child, I found in my father's, why I was snooping in my father's drawers, I don't know. I guess I was curious. But he had pornography. So again, you look at pornography and you see these women in positions wearing or not wearing, and you're like, oh, that's what I'm supposed to be. Right? So now all of these knotted things are coming into my being. And, and then, right, you're a teenager. And then teenagers are doing, is this a word? Sexploration? I don't know if I made it up or not, but it means exploring <laughs> sex. And again, I found myself in all sorts of situations. And guess what? Looking back, when we're a victim, two things happen. One is we don't know that we have a voice, choice, and power. Because guess what? Oh, I didn't write it up there. But in our family of origin, we don't, we don't talk, we don't trust, and we don't feel. 
So the combination of victimization with shame-based family, I mean, the grace of God to me is, is why I can stand up here today and even talk about this. Uh, again, what I was saying earlier is, Lord, I can't do that. First of all, my family. Like when I think of saying anything about my family, like I can't do it. I can't talk about them. Because it feels shameful. It feels disloyal. And let me just let you know, the secret in my family was my mom got pregnant out of wedlock in 1950. That was the secret. <clears throat> I remember saying to mom, when is you and dad's anniversary? Because lots of kids at school were like, oh, my parents went out and celebrated their anniversary last night. And I'm like, oh, anniversary. I wonder when mom and dad's anniversary is. Emotional slap. It's none of your business. It's something personal between your father and I. That was not what was happening at school. <laughs> Everybody else knew their parents' anniversary. Hmm, weird. More knots. When I was 21, I didn't want to go back home. <laughs> was, I'm going to say, a little bit dysfunctional, a lot dysfunctional. And I just didn't feel comfortable there. So I applied to VISTA, Volunteers in Service to America. I wanted to help people. I knew I wanted to help people. Uh, Evidently, on the VISTA application, there's a place where you can check if you want to be considered for the Peace Corps if they don't, can't place you in VISTA. Oh, I forgot to mention, I am a nutrition major. And I eat sugar every day. That's my addiction. <laughs> so uh, that did not last very long. I had one job in a nursing home as a, um, a dietary manager and... It just wasn't a good fit. I had, to, I had to feed people healthy food, and I wasn't into that. <laughs> um, so I lost my train of thought. See, it happened again. It, I, I did this <laughs> this afternoon with, with Paul's colleagues. I'm like, where was I going with that? So 21. 20, Vista. Vista. Oh, thank you. See, it's so nice to know that people are actually listening. I'm not listening to me, but other people are. <laughs> So I had checked this box that said, if you can't place me in VISTA. They couldn't place me in VISTA. Oh, doesn't Appalachian need help with nutrition? <laughs> so evidently, um, the next week, and I remember going home to the dorm. I was living in the dorms and crying, thinking, what am I going to do? I don't want to go home. Um, the next week, um, I got a letter saying, you're going to what I thought was Libya in the Peace Corps. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to Libya. Well, it was Liberia, West Africa. So as a 21-year-old, <clears throat> got on a plane, went over to Liberia, uh, did in-country training, with, again, with my, master, or with my uh, nutrition degree. And that's really where I remember looking up at the sky, and I was in a small village, um, incredible people. Uh, I, I felt like... The people that I met did so much for me, and I, I just did not feel like I offered anything back. It was very, I don't want to say discouraging, but I feel like Mama Africa helped me like I've never been the same. So that experience really broadened um, my idea of the world and God's creation of, of people that are different, and yet all of us being human. And that was very powerful for me. Um, when I came home... I ended up, uh, so I have an adventuresome spirit. Dad used to take us camping, and I love travel, and I can sleep in tents, and not anymore. Um, but there was this place called Discovery Land down in Texas, and Discovery Land had a, um, it, was, it was a psychiatric hospital without walls. Now, you might think I was in it as a patient, but no, I wasn't. I was hired <laughs> to work with the teenagers that were living outdoors. So the return Peace Corps newsletter said, rock climb, raft, canoe, with emotionally disturbed youngsters. Well, I didn't know what emotionally disturbed youngsters was, but I knew that I wanted to rock climb and hike and canoe and raft. So I get down. <laughs> <laughs> to this um, uh, interview, I, I paid to go from Pennsylvania down to Texas. And uh, they said, oh, yeah, Judy, 
they'd say, How do, wh what do you do when you're scared? Oh, yeah, I stayed in a big house once. Yeah, that was really scary. Uh, what do you do with anger? Oh, I love people. I don't get angry. At the end of that interview, they said, you know what? We just don't think you're what we're, <laughs> we're looking for. Again, reminding you, I didn't know what a feeling was, right? Um, so they basically said, mm-mm. And I said, well, my plane doesn't leave till Monday. Could I go out to the group? They had these groups out in the wilderness. Um, and so what happened when I was out in the wilderness is I heard teenagers as young as 13 and as old as 17 talking about their feelings. The whole treatment was, I have a discussion. And when somebody had a discussion, we all got in a group, <clears throat> 10 of us, two counselors, uh, 10, of, 10 young people, and they would talk about their feelings. And I was like, wow, wow. So what I did was I came home, I wrote him a letter, and I said, thank you. Like, I learned so much from being in those groups. Guess what? The next week, and I should have known that it was hard to hire people to do that job, but I, that was not my perception at the time. Uh, they said, we'd like you to come down and work for us. So I lived outdoors in a tent for a year, but I got to practice and listen to people <laughs> sharing their feelings. And that was powerful for me and very antidotal to don't talk, don't trust, and don't feel. We still haven't gotten to the trust part, right? So when I finally did find my mister, um, luckily I was walking with the Lord. I was attending Calvary Chapel of San Jose. Um, I had come out to California to be a group home parent. And again, living with teenagers, and here was their pitch. Oh, if you've lived in with teenagers for two months at a time, we only want you for three days a week, or four days a week, and then you get three days off. And I'm like, cool. Um, and that's where I met my husband. He wasn't, he wasn't, a, um, he wasn't in the group home. <laughs> he was actually at a master's program. And he, um, he and I, I was looking for a Christian. I was looking for a man that loved the Lord. And this man loved the Lord more than anything else. And so again, that was very attractive to me. Um, within our relationship, you know, this didn't come out for years, but I remember when we would have um, sex, when we would uh, make love, I would cry. And I was crying because of how loved and um, enfolded and appreciated and, and devoted, I felt. Um, later, he thought that there was something else going on, like he was doing something wrong. So communication is really important. So I'm here to not say that my relationship has been all bed of roses. I mean, marriages are, are, are difficult. Um, but with that in my life and with Jerry, we had two kids. He was able to help me with, you know, child care, went back to school. Then I started, once I got my master's degree, then there was this, I'm going to say that was 87. So who's good at math? How many years till, hmm? Oh, like four years ago. Sure. Let's say 31 years. <laughs> I, was, I was a clinician. I was a counselor. Uh, I helped people. I sat with people. I uh, tried my best to be a helper. Um, and through those helping opportunities, I heard story after story after story of uh, trauma, broken boundaries, um, victimization, and um, my own uh, trauma uh, story, just get, I kept visiting that and connecting. And so when you haven't done your own work around your own sexual trauma, brokenness, it is very difficult to sit with people who are trying to work out their own uh, sexual trauma, just brokenness in general. Um, I, I honestly don't know how anyone, and if, if this is you, please talk to me afterwards because I've never met anyone who 
feels like they are not like like sexually they had a healthy they have a healthy we might have a healthy sexuality now but our journey of sexuality has been far from from healthy and it's an area where we don't talk about and we keep visiting uh, shame and so we keep it hidden and and the church unfortunately we I don't know. I, I've been in the church, and I can't ever remember um, any uh, teaching, anything like you're doing now, like talking about, and I love the, the term sexual ethics. Uh, I teach legal and ethical uh, uh, ethics, uh, legal and ethical issues for counselors. And um, sexual ethics is what we, I think, can all benefit from. I never thought of sex being ethical. I mean, it sounds weird, but, you know, it's a morality thing, right? You're either good or you're bad. You're either doing what you should be or you're not doing what you should be. That's black and white thinking. That's not where a lot of us live. A lot of us are in the gray. And again, my shame was huge. I did not want anybody, so much so that I gave my husband, before he got married, my journals. Because I had kind of journaled this, like, I'm doing this behavior, I'm being promiscuous, I don't feel comfortable, I feel guilty, um, Lord help me, that, those sort of cries. Uh, but really not knowing uh, how to heal or what to do. Literally, my husband's hand in the back had said, yeah, can't read them. Not a good I would never encourage, <laughs> whether or not you read them, you might act like you read them because <laughs> the rejection that I felt, the shame that I felt, it, it went with me into our relationship. It was, it was really difficult. I felt like, but you don't know me. These journals are me. This is where I poured my heart out. This is where I could be honest before God. And for him to reject that reading those, and now I understand it was his pain. You know, he has his own history of sexual abuse and physical abuse. So he, it was about him, it wasn't about me. But how many times do we personalize those rejections? And we think there's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with me. And we hide. So I have this idea, we, we do this, we, we do a hologram, like <laughs> I'm back here and I'm projecting out here what I think or who I think you need me to be. And it starts in our family. My shame-based family needed me to be a certain way, to participate in their family and, and keep things hidden. And nobody sat me down and told me that, but I knew very clearly that I needed to be who my parent needed to be. Because if there was any sort of acting out, people would look at us and say, oh, bad parents. Oh, you're the problem. Oh, shame on you. My parents were already buried in shame. My mom was a Nazarene, good Nazarene <laughs> church girl who unfortunately couldn't teach Sunday school at 16 because she wore lipstick. Shame on her. Again, back in the, I don't even know when that was. Um, and my dad, his history, and again, this goes back to sexual brokenness, intergenerationally. Uh, dad's dad was, his mother uh, was working for, they're both from a very small town in Pennsylvania, and my great-grandmother was working for a um, um, wealthy uh, couple in town, and she got pregnant. Was it rape? Was it consensual? Was it an affair? Who knows? But she left town pregnant with my grandfather and then came back after she had him. Well, my grandfather grew up as the town, forgive my language, bastard, because he had no father. And in those days, I mean, still now, I don't know if anybody uses the term bastard, but maybe to Christian cut, not Christian cuss, maybe to cuss somebody out. <laughs> it's not a Christian cuss word. Um, but so the guy from the wrong side of the track gets the good church girl pregnant. Shame on her, shame on him, right? I still remember my mom called me on her 50th wedding anniversary, which I didn't know. 
And she says this. She goes, Judy, I don't know if you know or not, but your dad and I uh, have been married 50 years today. And I, part of me wanted to scream in the phone, hell no, you've kept it a secret for 50 years. No, why would I know? And the other part of me started tearing up. I thought something that should be celebrated. Any of you have been married? And you can imagine how that goes for 50 years. Um, a lot of ups and downs. I lost a child um, at birth. My brother was a day old. Um, lost uh, another brother to suicide. Uh, lots and lots of pain in our family. Um, and I just said, no, Mom, I didn't know. But from that day on, every anniversary, I've sent them a card. And I've said, thank you. You know, you guys <laughs> do what a lot of people, you know, have not been able to do. I don't, I don't fault my parents. I don't blame them. I give my story as context. I talk about this because, bless my parents' heart, I can only imagine what it was like for either one or both of them to grow up when they grew up with the way they were treated, with the way society, you know, thought about them. Um, and they did the best they could. I'm going to go to a self-compassion. I'm going to invite and encourage self-compassion. Uh, hopefully that's okay. <laughs> because what I found um, in my clinical work five years at Good Sam doing assessments is that when I talk to people, they are so much kinder to their friends, to strangers on the street. But when I ask them, are you hard on yourself? They're like, oh yeah, oh yeah. No, I am judgmental, critical, ah, really? Like how, how can we treat ourselves that way? Uh, I'm gonna say shame, guilt, um, hiddenness, not believing that we're God's beloved. You know, <clears throat> I, I talked to the Paul's colleagues today. I'm not, I'm not sure if I share this here. At, age, at 21, at college, I, I chose to have an abortion. And again, that was an offense to myself. If you had heard me in any of my college classes and papers, you would have heard me say, if a woman gets pregnant, she needs to have the baby. I believe that. I love babies. And yet, when I found myself pregnant by some fly-by-night guy, you know, that I knew was not in a relationship with me for long term, uh, that's all I knew to do. Unfortunately, who I went to was a small group of people who said, can you get married? I said, no. They said, okay, you can go. Here's, in those days, can't remember what year that was. Again, all this is trauma. So when you have trauma, you lose track of memories. You lose track of um, time. Sometimes it's difficult to sit you, situate yourself. Uh, our nervous system goes on high alert. So anything that might resemble um, memories suddenly I'm highly anxious. If I had a stress dot on right now, anybody know what a stress dot is? <laughs> a little stress dot, it's a bio, um, bio dot, they call them. And it's a little temperature sensitive liquid. You've probably seen the mood rings, right? You know, you put a mood ring on. What it's measuring is galvanic skin temperature. And the idea is that when we're under stress, when a lion comes in here and all of us, hopefully, take off running, our body, our blood flow goes from our um, extremities into our internals to prepare us to run or fight. So what happens is our, our temperature in, in our extremities goes down. So the idea is you put a bio dot on and you see relaxed is blue, a little bit less relaxed, green, brown, black is stressed. So these biofeedback devices, again, were really helpful for me. I didn't know I was anxious. I didn't know I was on high alert. I would lived in my body as a victim of child molestation since I was four years old. I didn't know that was a problem. I didn't even remember it till I was 32. So the language that we have or don't have, the memories that we have or don't have access to, all of that can create 
unconscious abilities to a, a, a not a, we're not we're not aware of it. If we're not aware of it, we can't heal from it. So, to me, there's this call and encouragement to be honest. There was a song, "God's Not Afraid of Your Honesty." He can heal your heart if you speak honestly. An honest cry, he won't pass by. Um, I felt a lot of guilt and shame about my abortion. And I was in my master's program, and there's something called cognitive behavioral therapy. And it's a belief system. They say what you, an activating event happens, you have a belief about it, and then you choose, or you, you have a feeling about it, and then you choose a behavior. If you can change the way you think, you can change the way you feel. So what I did was I went to scripture, and I thought, in my mind, it, it was not forgivable, right? Uh, this is not something, I've taken the life of my baby. God could never forgive me for that. That was my belief. Well, scripture didn't hold up to that, so I challenged my belief. I said, what does God say? This is what I believe. What does God say? And again, little by little, going into scripture and saying, what does God say about me, was very eye-opening. And when I recognized that God had not turned for me like I thought he had, I'll tell you, when my dad got mad, if he didn't show up for dinner, you know, he was kind of mad. If he didn't show up for dinner for three days, he was really mad. So I had a dad who disappeared when he was angry. Well, certainly God was angry at me, right? So God disappeared. It was years before I understood that's not a truth, Judy. You turn away from God. You're hiding. Your shame is getting in the way of you receiving God's grace, God's healing, God's forgiveness. How many times do our beliefs get in the way of our healing? Again, it, it makes sense. Our, our nervous system is on high alert. We're constantly scanning the horizon for anything that might attack us or threaten us. And we're not calm. We don't have a peace, a peace and a calm. And God wants us to have a calm and peaceful heart. How can we be joyful if, if you know, we, we don't have this place to settle and this place of returning to what my friend Jim Wilder calls Camp Joy? You know, um, I didn't lose my train of thought, but I'm like, where am I going with this? <laughs> um, so little by little by little, uh, this is not something, I, I can't tell you the number of times I wished I was a fairy godmother and had a wand and could just take people's pain away. But what I've recognized more and more is that what God has prepared me to do is sit with people in their pain and be with them. Sometimes I don't have to do anything but show up and be with. Even when I know, I'm like, what do I say? What do I do? How can I comfort? How can I heal? No, Drew, you can't. It's not your job. It's not your role. God heals. But he uses us, and he uses our connection and our willingness to be with people in their messiness and their pain. I can't tell you the number of people, I'm just going to say over the last year, we have a, a program called CalWorks uh, in, in um, Santa Cruz County. It's women that are coming out of domestic violence, um, maybe homelessness. Um, and I meet with five people every week um, in that program through telehealth. And I tell you, these women are inspiring so many things, so much trauma, layer upon layer, and they have this resilience. And I think our faith and our relationship with God is so resilient for us. Once we recognize that God's towards us and is, we're his beloved, he's not judging us, we're judging ourselves. And again, the voices of people, I chose unwisely to go back home and, and say to my parents that the psychiatrist that hired me to work at Discoveryland, it wasn't my psychiatrist, <laughs> told
told me, you know what? You need to go home and tell your parents who you really are. Okay. Remember, I was a compliant child. <laughs> I waited till I was 21 to drink. You know, there are rules to follow. And this is a psychiatrist, and she's suggesting I need to go home and tell my parents who I am. Not a good idea. Not a good idea at all. Because everything that my mother had tried to do, overprotection, not letting me go anywhere on a school night. Mind you, I had four brothers, and they could do everything, right? So, um, again, wh why did the boys get to go out and I don't? Well, hindsight says she was afraid I was going to get pregnant. Guess what happened? I got pregnant out of wedlock. I, I just sometimes am drawn to tears because I think, how would it have been different if mom had set me down, or you know, some conversation, some dialogue saying, hey, this is what your dad and I faced. This was tough. And you know, here's why we want to protect you. Here's why we're putting limits and boundaries on you. But again, they did not have the Lord as their guide. They didn't have that, that healing presence of the Holy Spirit to rely on. Um, so, all that to say, everything that my mom exerted control over, like it was, it didn't work, right? And not because I made it not work, I don't know how it happened. I mean, it happened, right? Again, lots of knots. And connecting these dots, I can only do it from this side of, of my life journey. Um... Have I been talking for an hour? Okay. <laughs> One thing I want to say about my family, my family was a good family. They were a moral family. They believed in hard work. They encouraged us. Um, however, what was absent in my family, as you can imagine, because I already said we don't talk, we don't trust, and we don't feel, I've come to call it emotional impoverishment. Just as poverty of, you know, resources and health care and um, what we need, food, so emotional poverty, poverty uh, a place in us that needs to be nourished, doesn't get nourished. And um, again, not blaming my family because it totally makes sense to me why my family wouldn't have given me emotional presence. But I spent a lot of time crying into my pillow. You know, again, tears were shameful. When mom lost her baby, she went inside her room and she cried alone. And it was very rare to hear my mom cry. You just managed things. You just kept going. Never heard my parents say, I love you. When I was 26 and got married the night before I got married, um, I said to my mom and dad, I love you. I love you, dad. I love you, mom. And they said back, I love you too. And that was the first time I ever heard my parents say, I love you, because I was able to offer it to them, and then they gave it back. I think what gets a lot, what gets in the way a lot of, for a lot of us, is not being able to love ourselves. And I think trauma, if you think, if I had a mirror up here, and we threw a rock at it, think of the, the broken image, and then stand in front of that mirror, is that a true representation of who we are? No. It's, it, it's a distorted image of who we are, not who God intended us to be. So that when we see that, we think that's us, right? Back to this. I'm back here, but I'm projecting this image. Here's who I want you to see. Here's who I want you to embrace. Here's who's acceptable from my position. Well, people find me acceptable. Oh yeah, good, you know, great, yes. You're doing all these things, good for you. Guess what? I can't receive it because I'm not getting it. I say to myself, if you knew me, you wouldn't say that. If you really knew who I was, you wouldn't be giving me that compliment. If you really knew who I was, you would not be feeling that way about me. So what happens is I'm back here alone, 
isolated in my guilt and shame, not loving myself, judging myself, criticizing myself for all the things that I've never done right in my life, right? Even though God, God's redemption is there for me. God sent Jesus as our Savior. I have that. I know that cognitively. <laughs> Henry Nowen, I don't know if anybody's heard of Henry Nowen, has been a spiritual father to me. He continues to call forth the beloved. And honestly, um, probably this, this past year, there's been a few times where I've been able to allow good stuff in without dismissing it, right? And like I said, I'm 69 years old. It's taken me a long, long journey of recovery. And in my mind, I've been recovering since about 32 when I went into my master's program. And to me, I'm recovering from, uh, I would call a shame-based family or a shame-based lifestyle. Um, I find when I talk to people, a lot of people resonate with this kind of way, like they're like, oh yeah, that's my family. Don't talk, don't trust, don't feel. Well, if any of your parent, you know, if, if you had a parent who was an alcoholic or a drug addict or uh, again, uh, maybe affairs, gambling, chances are your family may have been a shame-based family. Um, and again, when we are raised in a shame-based family, we don't get the skills and tools we need for relationship. So if I'm having trouble in my marriage, why, how would I not expect myself to have trouble? <laughs> I didn't learn skills and tools for intimacy. I didn't learn skills and tools for vulnerability. Vulnerability takes courage. It takes accepting myself, saying, God, I am not who I want to be, but you have saved me. You call me the beloved. In your eyes, I'm, I'm whole and I'm well. So many times we feel broken, and if we're broken, we need to be fixed. And I would posit that we need to be healed. And I love uh, what, what Pastor Andrew, I listened to both um, Pastor Paul and Pastor Andrew's sermon uh, just to kind of give me an idea of, of um, you know, the, how uh, this was being sort of uh, contextually. And I loved uh, that Pastor Andrew said, this is not us versus them. This is us and us. This is a human challenge, a human journey. Like we, we are, we can see each other reflected in each other's eyes. But you know the thing about shame? We don't look in somebody else's eye. We look down. So we miss that opportunity to look at someone. Uh, because again, shame on us for you fill in the blank, whatever, you know, the list of things that God will never forgive. And God forgives, but I'm not able to forgive myself. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's a good place maybe to, um, to land.